And today I'd like to present a short paper connected to the research project that I am currently a member of. And uh, it is found by the, the journals, uh, journals National Science Center. And the paper will, will be concerned with the possibilities of archive-based research of Greek pottery given peculiar ontology of archaeological sources. So, uh, before we start uh, to stick to the, the, this very strict time frame, I'm going to use my notes, so it won't be as entertaining as it's supposed to be, so sorry about that. So, uh, in this paper, I want to develop a very simple linear line of thought about the, the significance of uh, the archives and archaeological documentation for production of, of science production of knowledge that is called archaeology. So, in one of his papers, James uh, Dix, a famous, famous American anthropologist, uh, proposed that archaeological documentation, field records, and similar works should be treated as archaeography, uh, seeing that they stand in similar relation to archaeology as uh, ethnography does to ethnology. So, he postulated a, a division of our field uh, on, in, into description and analysis. Uh, well, it is important to see this division, however, I am uh, not a big fan of it because divisions should separate things clearly and how to separate descriptions, descriptions from the artifact and descriptions from distance, uh, you cannot, I, I claim. I'll go as far as saying that the description of the artifact and not the archive itself is that the source of archaeological research it is the subject of archaeology and the archive is its excavation site. So, First, they try to, to separate those things, artifact, its description, and the discourse, and, and, and see what will happen. So, uh, this is a drawing uh, of a very famous uh, Corinthian vase known today as uh, Kiji Olpe. Uh, it was published in, in, a, in a very famous book on, on Greek art by Ernst Fuhr. Uh, now, uh, this is very interesting because the, the, the drawing, like, like a photograph, is, inter is an interpretation in itself. Uh, but here, the, the outer full had uh, switched the scenes on the on the actual vase. They are not in the, the, the same order because uh, this one isn't the biggest or longest. Actually, this one is, and uh, this one uh, also. There's this warrior frizz on the neck, and this uh, there's this procession is always on the belly. So the thing is that when you look at this picture, you think that this is the main frizz, the the, the, the warrior frizz. Whereas on the actual artifact. This one is, is, is more, more prominent. So, now, obviously, the description favors this description favors Hopper face, and actually has shaped the, the other readings of this artifact for, for decades. And uh, the, the, the reading that the Hopper face is the most important could not be separated from the object itself. So, uh, only recently scholars have returned to artifact and established a proper, proper order of scenes, therefore reconstituting the, the author. Now, it's not that the author was, was rediscovered or that the, the, the previous generations were, were laymen in comparison to us, far from it. The thing is that the author was re examined along the new ideas, new notions operating within the discourse. So, so the need for reinterpretation get down from top to the bottom. So, uh, from general theory all the way down to, to, to the artifact. Now, how the real open fits into this? Well, the real object, material object, fits only if you could not reinterpret it with the current state of documentation. So, it was dug up from New Zealand and treated as it was just, as it just had been, had been found. Now, uh, now, the idea that artifacts are texts is, uh, is nothing new, provided that you are you, you, you understood you understand text as, as a part of this inter intertextual uh, framework network with, with plural meanings and archaeological side would be it would be a palimpsest. But recent movement in, in theory around the return of things underlines the, the materiality of the object, the material aspect of artifacts, uh, materiality that cannot be uh, reduced to, to, to language. And, of course, I would, I would agree uh, with them, only that this materiality in, is in truth not very prominent in archaeological practice. 
ecology as a performance, a, a contact with material objects, comes to play only during excavations and museum projects. You would say that this is uh, all that archaeologists do. That's the, the, the totality of archaeology. So, in theory, because in practice, materiality is really subjugated by the distance. So, the first contact with, with, uh, with an artifact in context during excavation, this, this unique contact, is made via a set of rules, of course. And I will not talk about them uh, in this way because I'm more interested in the outcome of, of that contact. And the outcome could be archaeographical ar 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 description or uh, archaeological generalization. So, uh, both of them rely on recovered material objects as well as archives, actually. So, you need to access archives not only to get bigger picture, but also a, a deeper one, deeper understanding of the artifact itself. If you are making a generalization, you must nullify the difference between archive data you, you have acquired and excavation data. Uh, they become truly interchangeable. Uh, once the description of artifact is made, uh, those descriptions would serve, would serve as, as a referen reference point in the archive, and the, the, the source of the discourse is in fact collected description of all the artifacts. So, uh, when you have contact with material object in museum, it is taken out of the context. It needs documentation to exist. If you do not have, for example, for object provenance, number, whatever, just, just a thing. Even if you can recognize it, uh, there's not much you can do with it. Because the truth is that we come to museums when there's a problem with documentation, the error in the archive. So we must uh, return to the physical archive and access the physical sources. Uh, but, and above all, that is the chief proof of the textual bonding of our, of our science, that if we access only the material object, there's not much that we can talk about it. So, in fact, we operate within uh, one archive of, of sources, but since the archaeology is, as you can say, it's, it's diachronic, it's actually, it's not synchronic, it feels that it's synchronic, but it's diachronic, and ways in which it was organized, as well as practices of destroying context in order to translate it into records, the, the, this practice evolved in such a way that we must constantly access real archives. Uh, the accumulation of the sources requires indexation, so again, we need real archives. Since it's already archive-based science, the organizing uh, all archaeological data into easily accessible stores should improve the distance. So I would argue in favor of that statement using an uh, example from my branch of archaeology and how it was changed with the development of, of the archive. So, Repainted pottery is a, is a, is a huge cluster of, of sources. There are hundreds of thousands of artifacts all around the world, but it is still one type of artifacts, right? The product of specific craft, in specific archaeological frame, and condition. So if you imagine big pottery in context, in, in antiquity, in its chain of patois, it would be coherent. Now, what, what 19th century excavation mania did was actually dropping a bomb inside this cluster and uh, spread it all over the, the, the world. That is the, 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 the scale of the decontextualization of uh, these artifacts. You can ask uh, how to conduct research when objects are located in uh, hundreds of museums and usually they do not possess any records outside of it. So, well, that, that, was the pro that, that problem was evident from the very beginning of, 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 of collections. So obviously museums were releasing some catalogs of objects, but actually the revolutionary idea came from, from France when Edmond Potier here uh, postulated that a joint catalog of objects should be published in the 1919 and 1922 first volume of what is known as Corpus Vazorum Antique Forum uh, was published. I'm sure that most of you know what, what the CDA is and how it operates, but I'm going to talk about it briefly. It is uh, international catalog of, of ancient pottery, primarily, primarily Greek and, and Italian, that the objects came from all around the world, uh, but no matter the country, and that's, that's, that, that's the key thing, and no matter the museum from which, way, from which they belong, they are described and interpreted using formal, very formal criteria of CBA. 
So even though the, the, the forms do vary and they vary greatly, they are not even published in the same language, but the form of the analysis is the same. So because the form of the description is the same, actually it, re it in some way reconstitutes the, the content because we are still we are operating within one really no matter no, no matter the best, not the matter the best. So the, the need for processing data as well as to, to establish proper context for the abstract is, is met in the form of CVA catalogs. And for some branches of the discipline, uh, it, it provides sufficient background. I am studying uh, iconography, so for me, having a catalog with pictures is ideal, but for others, it is not so, so glamorous. The accessibility of this catalog compared to the excavation and reports favors actually the format and the catalog. And these museums objects are still the contextualized, even if you, if you put them under the 3D scanner, you cannot connect them, reconnect them with the records from the excavations because there isn't. So uh, these defective art artifacts dominate. And uh, presently almost 400 volumes were published, but they are connected and indexed together. So that is uh, very easy to, to find something among them. And uh, plus, majority of the volumes are available in the digital archive, so it's, it's even more easy. Uh, the problem with the CBA is that it has been around for so long, almost 100 years, that its first volumes are terribly, terribly outdated. They present the state of documentation as was prevalent in the years before uh, the war, just have a look how, uh, how the description uh, changed. Uh, not to mention that all volumes do not have even proper dating and attribution. The archive is so old that using the, the very first volume is like a, a journey into the history of archaeology. So our science should be a synchronic one. It is not, obviously, because it's been around for two centuries. But it's always, uh, it's always like that in the distance, right? <laughs> uh, we have older, uh, if we have older updated records, we could do only two things. One, return to museum and reinterpret them, or to diminish them, their voice from, from our world. So that's why we, in, in Poland, well, to my supervisor, but I'm um, so part of, 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 of the, that team, uh, well, we decided that since uh, all the volumes of CBA are not sufficient any longer, we should republish and reinterpret the whole series, our whole series. But this is something revolutionary, it's a small revolution, because nobody's doing it. Why? Uh, there are still clusters of, of, of quotes unpublished, and many people think that going back will start uh, this vicious cycle, and the project will be eating its tail constantly for, for, for years to come. I'm not saying that they are wrong or right. Uh, this, uh, these are just two different methodological approaches, which one which values index and the second which values this. So, uh, with this, we'll move very shortly to, to, to one last thing, which is online archive. Because it's not just an online archive, it's an archive made from archive of Sir John Bisley, who was the only one person that lived and probably would ever live that was able to gather all these pieces from the, the shell of the contextualization. So, our context for interpreting the pottery is almost its own invention. The archive has problematic inter, uh, interface, and there's a, there, are, there are issues with it. Uh, but it is the most important tool for any researchers interested in ancient Greece because, well, obviously using this, this interface you can uh, easily find inspiration for everything. Now, with that fast data comes great responsibility and also simplification. And adding to that, the fact that anyone can, uh, can access the archive is, is free for everyone. It, it results in a democratization of previously very narrow, very exclusive part of the sources. Uh, imagine if all archaeological archives would be open to all kinds of researchers and they would have access to items of varying degree of record because some of them would be thoroughly, thoroughly just described and other would only have numbers. Right, the, 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 the place on, on, on the shelf and nothing else. So, the idea behind continuous reinterpretation within archives is that scholars will be making them regardless. So, it is on the shoulders of archive keepers that responsibility for, for interpretation. For you can only do two things with artifact in such a scenario. Well, give it a new meaning, reinterpret it, or you can lock it away in tiny boxes and throw away the key. And there are there are probably millions of artifacts uh, in, in the archives of archaeology that are actually locked in the tiny boxes in, in very dark rooms. So, to sum up, uh, the role of the archive for, for research is not only to provide ground for it, 
as it should be, but it's it's, it's deeper one. It also it, it should also it should also available to, to, it also to, the role is to flow with the discipline and and to update uh, when it's needed. Archives must be dynamic uh, alongside uh, the, the scientific uh, discourse. It should go alongside it, uh, not just like a, a reference point. So with that uh, last statement, I'll conclude my presentation. So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I will answer them gladly. <laughs>